I've got a little problem here this morning, and uh, what happened is I left a couple of my tools at home, so I kind of have to improvise a little bit. And uh, I went to the truck to see if I had any tools, and the only thing I could come up with was this. <laughs> so, yeah, and then I looked around, I had a piece of two by four in there, so there's my material. Uh, I cut a couple little pieces, and somewhere along the line, somebody stole my uh, center here, so they don't have a center either. So I'm working a little handicapped here this morning, but I figured out how to put this in here. I, I guess that'll hold. Um, so far, so good. Dick's going to move out of the way. So, I guess I got it going forward here. Yeah. You can speed it up a little bit. So, I'm going to try to use this to make something out of that little stub of wood. Well, Dick is a naysayer on this. So, the key here is you got to have a sharp tool. Obviously, this is really sharp. I will make something out of this. You just watch. Another cut here. See how this works out. Took a little get used to this, but I think I got it. I think this will work. I've done a couple others before this, so little miniature tops. Turned with an axe. <laughs> Go figure. So if you want to improvise, that's my slant on improvise. But what I really want to do is we'll talk about turn a finial. That's obviously a pretty good size finial, and it's not the one I'm going to turn. But I want to put that up there to show you <coughs> the technique we get to do that finial. I guess I did have the parts here that I needed. Um, we'll start off a little bit and talk about tools which I have quite an array of here. And we'll talk about uh, a parting tool here first, and I got a couple other things here to do. We'll, we'll talk a little bit. It's really key to have as sharp a tool as you can come up with. The parting tool, when we go to sharpen this thing, if we look at it this way, we want to touch just this little bit of an edge here. This is rotated 90 degrees. And if you do this right, and, you've, uh, and I've converted myself. This is a, a, a diamond hone. I'm really convinced that this is the only way to go. They last forever, and they just sharpen things like really fast. So what you want to do is you want to touch just the end of the tool here. That's the sharpened edge of it. And if you do it right, and you set it there like that, and you can put it down here, you will push this across your sharpening piece, and it'll touch there and then there, and that's where you want it. And you have a curve in here, so you automatically just touch here and here. But you put it on there, and you run it back and forth a couple of times, and you give you a nice sharp tool. That's for the parting tool, and that's one of the most key tools on this whole deal.
what I wanted, in order to make a spindle, and I, what I'm going to do is copy this. I've done a few things here already. But just to concentrate on, we're going to do what I call a connect the dots method. So if I, I, I'm using this because it's bigger. There's a couple of key points in this. If we have a dimension from here to here, dimension this way, then when we reach this point, it's going to have a diameter. And we're going to regulate that with a caliper. So from here to here is a dimension. From this point to this next point here is another dimension this way, but it also has a diameter. We again go from here to this next spot. That's another dimension. It also has a diameter. So if we establish these diameters and we get all those done, and I'm actually going to turn this piece, but by establishing those diameters, like I've done on this block here, then we can go along and we'll do what I call connecting the dots. And we'll get into something like this. So if we go from here to here, there's a dot. It connected by a round. A little flat spot, a little cove, a little flat spot. If we establish these diameters and these lengths here and just go through and connect all these dots with the different curves, we end up with a finial. It's not as complicated as it sounds. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this around so you kind of understand. If you look at this drawing and look at this, you'll understand where the dots are and, and how, it, uh, how it works. I pre-turned some of these because I didn't want to spend a whole bunch of time doing a bunch of what I call busy work. So we'll get right to the point of finishing off I did this on my lathe, so it might be off just a little bit. Um, which kind of brings me to a point that we, uh, I should discuss. When you do some turning like this between centers, um, if you take this part off and you want to return it to the, to the lathe, if you take, I'll take this back out to, sh to show you. The spur center has four points. If you take one of those points and make a little mark in it, so when you put it into your workpiece, it'll be just a slightly different than the other four or the other three points. It'll have a little mark in it. So if you take it out, it's got that mark in it, and you take it over here and you want to put it back in there, it's going to put it, that little mark in your piece of wood here, and everything will line up, and it'll be exactly centered again. It's kind of a handy little deal. trying to remember exactly where I'm at, but I think I'm down here to this point here, which will be this point right here. I'm going to go in there with a parting tool and, uh, and establish that diameter. It's only three-eighths of an inch. That's where the concept of having a sharp tool comes into play. If you don't have a sharp tool, you can't make that cut. So now we've completed all these cuts. We've cut these, what I call stations, which will be this diameter, 
this diameter and this, these, these four diameters are all the same. We've got a diameter in here that we're just going to do that by eye and all these others. We've established all those, so now it's a question of connecting the dots. And we can use a couple of different tools um, to do that. my sample up here so I don't screw it up. The first unit here is we're just going to have to round this off a little bit. We're going to use a pointed tool, kind of a round nose tool. Some of these round nose tools you can have different angles. Can you see that? So you see the difference in the, in the angles? One's quite shallow and the other's quite pointed. And when we're doing the cutting on this, we're going to be cutting on the side of the tool, right in here. Not on the point, but on the side. As we go down the hill, so to speak, there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can do it with this. dreaded skew and you can probably get down in there and get that little bottom part of that one of the things that happens when you do the parting tool what I like to do is I may show it up here This edge right here is established when you do the grinding. If you put this on a <clears throat> and you flatten the side of it, then that little curved edge there and that and you do all four of those edges, they become cutting edges. And so if you get down into a small point like that and you can take your that's your parting tool but we're going to use the edge of the parting tool, not the point of the parting tool, to soften that little curved spot. You'll find out it's really sharp, and you can put a nice little curve in there with not much difficulty. And you can get to the bottom of that quite easily. On this one, it's got a little rounded edge on the other side too, so we're going to use just that little bit there to around that edge. So now that's that bottom spot. Now because I can't get in here with the with the pointed tool to hollow that little this spot right here, I'm going to take down this part of it here first to get it out of the way. I don't know whether the camera can catch that or not, but again, we're cutting down on the side of the point, not the tip of the point. So now we got that edge. Now we got around the other edge. And that one we've got to take all the way down to that shoulder. So now we're down to that shoulder. The next spot we're going to go through from this shoulder, we're at that point now, we're going to take it down here to the next dot that we want to connect. So we're going to use that round nose tool again. 
we got quite a bit of material to take out of there, obviously. Now this is going to have to be a smooth transition. Again, we're cutting on the side of that tool, not the point. square up this just a little bit make that shoulder a little bit better that's an interesting point too about the parting tool you can plunge straight away or if you put the tool in there and you cock it just a little bit so just the barely tip of the edge of the point is contacting you can just kind of scrape sideways across that can you see that on the camera and then if you want to clean up that edge just a little bit over here to the left, you can go in there and do that. You get these really fine little shavings off of there. So that'll be really smooth. So we've got one element left to go. Two elements, actually. And we're going to cut down this. Uh, we've got one more point to establish. Now we gotta establish the diameter of the little ball on top. So we got that diameter set up on the caliper. We'll come in here. So there's the diameter. Looks easy, doesn't it? <laughs> there's a cut I'm talking about moving just sideways with your parting tool. There's a couple of different ways to make that a round ball. You can do it with that pointed tool again. You can do it with this. One of the things I kind of like to try to do sometimes a real simple way to keep yourself out of trouble is to take what is now supposedly a, a round. It's not quite right. If you knock the corners off with your parting tool, that's the start of your, of your ball. You can knock off the corners on the other side. Take the edge of your skew, just knock that bottom corner off a little bit. Take this one around that a little bit. You can't get into too much trouble this way. But of course, you can take that round edge and you can now you can you can do it this way. This is get a nice smooth cut. It'll be very very smooth when you get done. It takes a little practice.
it's fairly round. We'll clean up the bottom corner just a little bit. Now we got to go back and do this right in here. Now we're going to use the point of that tool a little bit. And since that's such a shallow, I've got a little smaller cutter over here. These little tools come in different sizes, obviously, and this is a smaller one. A little bit better, bigger radius. Go back and clean up that just a little bit. Make it smooth. Obviously, the bottom of that, is, I think this is a finial for a clock, so this little bottom spot would be in a drilled hole up in the top of the clock somewhere. Now you've got to cut that off. Ticklish part in some respects, because you don't really want to cut it all the way off in the lathe, unless you do it somewhat like this. What will happen is, a little tiny spud off the end of this will break off this nice rounded surface. It'll break off in there and then you've got to fill it and that's not going to look too good. So we're going to take it down pretty small. there. So all we're doing is we're establishing some diameters by making our plunge cuts with our parting tool. We'll establish a dimension from one end to the other to a spot and then connect the dots. It's that simple. And the neat part about this is by using these tools in this way this is really smooth. This surface right here, we're going to pass that around. It's not exactly the same, but I didn't try to make it exactly the same, but it's close. Questions? Speak up. The rounded tools you're using, how do you sharpen those? You sharpen them by hand, or you sharpen them with a pig? Good question. Glad you asked. Um, this is one of the ways that I do it. If you, that's the angle. If you take that angle and you take the tool and rotate it as you push it across here, so we're establishing the angle, start at one edge, and push it across here. That's not going to stay because I don't have anything to hold it here. But if you look at the back edge when you do that, or you can do it like this, this takes a little bit more effort. If you can put it down on something flat, clamp this down, and then take your tool and push it across there and rotate it as you push it, it'll follow that edge. It'll give you a superb edge. Now the inside corner of that, Another diamond home, really handy. You can lay that diamond home right in the, the trough of that skew, take it a couple of times across that top edge, and all you're trying to do is remove that burr at that top edge. The bottom edge first. You don't ever want to sharpen this much up here. All you're trying to do is remove the burr, and that little round diamond file is going to do that for you quite easily. Other questions? How many times can you hone it before you need to resharpen 
it all depends a little bit on what you're turning. If you're turning something soft, or if you're turning something hard, uh, or if you're using it a lot, I'm going to say that I haven't sharpened this in probably six months, and I've used it a lot. So all you're trying to do is dress up that edge, and if it's a piece of high-speed steel, it's going to hold that edge quite a bit. Unlike bowl turning, it's spindle turning, you're not removing a lot of wood. I need to send this around. You're not removing, it's more finesse than wood removal. And if you understand when you're turning a big diameter bowl or a platter like that, when you're turning out here, there's a lot of material being passed in front of that tool. But you're on a small diameter like this, even though it might be going pretty fast, the amount that you're taking off is very small. And you're, the amount of tear on, or impact on the tool is not that much. I'm going to step back just a little bit. We'll kind of go over a little bit on how you use some of these tools. I've made some grooves in here, and I want to talk a little bit about how to use this tool a little bit more rather than doing a finished product. And this is just a piece that I cut some grooves in. And I want to concentrate on using the sides of that chisel. So we're going to take I haven't the foggiest idea. Fast. <laughs> uh, we're, I can tell you closer. We're probably in somewhere in the neighborhood of 2000. But you see how when I hand this turning out of there, you're going to see how smooth this cut becomes. But the idea of pushing a tool in there and rotating it, and what you're doing is you're shearing this wood off. You're not tearing it off. If you take this and just plunge it in, I'm going to leave that in there. You feel that cut, and you feel the cuts that I just made by doing this shearing action. You can not only make that cove, but you can do, I'm going to toss this around, somebody ready to catch. Now you'll see how smooth those cuts are, and that's what you're striving for. This block of wood I've got set up is doing a bead. And we can do a bead the same way, using that same tool. There's a couple of different ways of making a bead. This is just one of them. make a couple of grooves down in here. Now we want to make a bead out of that. And we're going to use that same technique. We're going to start in the top there. And we're going to roll this tool over. Not the best bead in the world, but you'll get the idea. The part that I want to emphasize by doing it that way, you're going to be doing zero sanding. I've made a couple other beads on here, but the one I just did here, 
I'll let pass that around so you can. F it's the keynote is that angle to keep that bead. Now feel that bead. Is it smooth? Yeah. Yep. Um, we're going to do one more thing on spindle turning. One of the things that is a problem for a lot of people. Seems like every chair leg you ever made or every table leg you ever made has got a transition from a round to a square. And that seems to be a real trouble spot for a lot of people. There's about two or three different ways of taking this and making Trying to get a round spot in here so I can. Okay. You want to be able to make a transition from a square to this round piece as a, as a stairway spoke or as a chair leg or something like that. There's a couple of different ways to do that. You can do it with a skew, which is a, and you match this angle right here with the angle that you want to, you got to match that with this angle right there. Can you see that? And you can take that skew and you line it up with that angle and just push it and push it in. find that it's a real nice smooth cut. That's one way. The other way would just to take this parting tool and go in straight at an angle. But the problem with that is it's going to tear that green out. You get the job done. Same thing. But you'll find out that that's a lot rougher than this smooth cut here. We're going to do one more way for all you bowl turners because you've got a bowl gouge hanging around. You're going to be able to use it to do a very nice transition from square to round. Everybody's got a 3 8 inch bowl gouge, I think. If you take the angle of that bowl gouge like this, can you see that? You get it on the camera? If you match that angle with this bevel, you can ride that bevel all the way to the bottom. And you'll put a pretty nice cut on there fairly easy. So you're just going to push it in there like this. Make a couple of cuts. I want 
take the parting tool, whoops, wrong parting tool, and square up that bottom. So there's three ways to make that transition from square to round. And you'll find out the best way is with the skew because it's going to shear the wood more than the others too and give you a really smooth cut. You'll never have to sand it and you won't get any tear out. This one, this one, this one. Sharpness of tools is really important. If you don't have sharp tools, you can't do it. If this particular piece of wood here is incredibly heavy, but you'll we'll try to do the same thing. But this wood really tears out really easy. So we're gonna, it's gonna be a little bit. But again, you can take this, and we'll just push it in sideways. Take it right to the bottom, clean up the bottom. Square this end up a little bit. Or not. In case you didn't recognize the wood, it's a piece of balsa. Balsa is probably the toughest wood you're ever going to try to turn because it's so soft and it'll tear out. And even though we got a little ragged in the beginning there, but you'll see. It's heavy too. Yes, it is. It's very heavy. More questions? So we're stepping back to the time I was in junior high school. So I don't remember, but I probably much, pretty much guarantee there was a whole bunch of perspiration there. It's, it's a little dicey when the first time you try it. There's no question about it. Um, but you know, I don't know what that diameter is. We'll open it up just a little bit. But there is a little bit of a you know, cautionary movement there. The key is, if you look at this caliper, those tips are rounded. You can't have them sharp edge. If they're sharp edge, they won't do that. What they'll do is they'll grab, and you can't have that. So make sure that your little calipers have got the round edge. And it's not that... So you're going to hold this in one hand, and you're going to bring this caliper, and you can't bring it at the top because it's going to interfere with your tool. You're going to have to bring it out from the, from the edge. So we'll just start in. That's the diameter. It's not difficult, and the nice part about these type of style parting tools is you'll see 
that they're wider right in the middle, they're narrow at the top, and they're narrower at the bottom. So as you put it in there, it, it has a clearance angle so it doesn't bind up. If this was flat on both sides, then it would bind up. But this is it's quite easy to do. But it helps to have a sharp tool. So you want to go back to the to the axe? Jeez. <laughs> Could you, uh, Ralph, could yeah. you show a little more and explain a little more about the skew, how you, what, before you go to the act? Because I've never used the skew. Before you get to that, could you show uh, how you're holding uh, the parting tool under your arm? Oh, okay, sure. That's part of the secret of one handed I hold it. Most tools have this kind of a form, and that's a good spot because you can get your hand at this point here and, and hold it in your... And I don't eat, all I'm just doing resting it kind of on my chest. And that's not a requirement, you can do it without that. But if you rest it on your chest like that, it gives you a spot where it's not going to wiggle waggle all over the place. When you're doing other turnings, and this is a skew, I don't normally hold it there. I usually hold it back here. So I can get a planing cut across here. And I've got that locked into my hip. It's a lot easier to hold it back there than it is to try to hold it out here and hold it tight against your hip. But if you've got your hand back here, it gives you a lot more leverage. And the skew is kind of, it's one of these deals if you want to make beads, and you can learn how to do that. That's the other way of making a bead with a skew. That's a, <laughs> That's kind of a learned experience because doing it with a skew is, is really hard. Until you get the hang of it, you'll get a lot of things. You'll get in there and you go like this. That's the first thing you're going to run. It's going to run on you. But if you can get the angle quite right, you'll be able to roll that bead. When you roll the bead, that bead comes really smooth. And of course, if you're doing a lot, if you're doing a hundred of these things, you don't want to spend all day making that bead. What do you want? Which pointer do you use? Yeah. Is that what you want? Yes. Sir. That show you? Yeah. That's what you want to see? Yeah. That's probably not as easy as it looks. <laughs> but it's all about practice. Okay. This, this is kind of cheating. But if you've got a hundred beads to turn, then you take a file and you make a bead tool. And so now you can come in here like this. You can do a bead like that. These are very easy to make. I'm going to have to have a class and show you how to do that. It's not as smooth as uh, as it doing it with a skew or the uh, the uh, small gouge, but with just a small amount of sandpaper, um, which I suppose I got hidden here someplace. Anyway, um, y you can. Even with that beading tool, you can smooth that off. I would say that the key to smoothing that off is the first time you sand it, take and if you can reverse the lathe, now all those little things you got wiped off one way are now going to go wiped off the other way, and it'll smooth that off real quick. It'll save you about 
half your sanding time by running it backwards on your first cut for sandpaper. Does that make sense? Because all these, be all these pieces of uh, grain are going one way, and you're going to come back there and wipe them back off the other direction. It'll take them off really quick. It'll make your sanding a lot easier. Questions? Are we going back to the axe? Hey, Ralph, <laughs> yeah. before you go to the axe, the safety tool, uh, when you grind your file, how do you grind it? That, it's actually pretty simple. Um, I take my 10 inch table saw and I put a cutoff tool in there, a grinding disc that's about an eighth of inch thick. I round the edge of that, that, uh, that disc and I put it on, on the table saw. Then I take this, we, we want to smooth off the top part of this, but then if you look, there's a back bevel on this. That's the exact radius of that disc that you have on a table saw. And you just stick it down on the table saw, this flat, and you move it around until you get that curve. And then you can make any diameter curve up to the, as small as an eighth inch. So I've got a, I got a half a dozen of these for making little beads like that. But when you're turning 20 spindles, you want to make all the beads the same, or you want to space them all the same. This is really the only way to go. It'll save you lots of time, and it'll all be nice and even. Answer the question? Yeah, any problems in doing that? Can you overheat the file and does it become brittle? Um, you don't want to get the uh, file is, is like 1075, 1085 steel. It's really high carbon and there's no, no alloys in it. So what you want to do is you want to avoid overheating it. In other words, don't get it red hot and avoid trying to get, it to, if it ever starts to turn a little bit blue on you, stop, let it cool. Do not put this in a piece of water. Because what it'll do is take and make microcrystalline structure uh, cracks in that piece of steel, and the first time you touch it with any kind of an impact, it's gonna break right off. So that's the thing to avoid because of a, the, the alloy and the steel. There isn't any, it's just all high carbon. Question? Sure. You can Well, that's my gist on spindle turning. Remember about that, it's not as tough as it looks. <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, spindle turning is a lot of fun. Um, it's not for everybody. Uh, if you're making a chair or a table or something like that, it's, uh, it's an acquired skill and you only have to do four legs at a time instead of 104 legs, so that makes it a little easier too. Um, if you turn one and it's not quite the same as this and it's a table leg or something, keep in mind you now use that first one as your sample and you turn everything to that so you don't necessarily have to try to go back to the original sketch because nobody's going to know the difference when you get done besides you. Then when you screw up the last one you go back and do the first one. <laughs> and it looks like the last you could. One. And that's where that little thing that I showed you about putting a little notch in the drive thing, so you can re-chuck all those spindles back up and they'll be in the same spot, they'll be in the same, same plane, and so you will be able to do that easily. Cool? Thanks. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.